Hey guys, it's Melissa here from MelissaOatman.com. Welcome to Awaken Your Inner Awesomeness, a daily podcast devoted to spirituality and self-help. If you're new, I want to welcome you. If you're returning, welcome back. So today we have a very interesting guest with us. We have Miss Laura Stevens with us, and she has just written a new book. And we have been discussing this book before we got on here to record the podcast. And I'm very excited for her to share all about this book with you. Uh, so I want to welcome you here today, Laura. Hi, thank you. Wonderful to be here. So um, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about your background, because um, you are a journalist, which mm -hmm. I find also extremely fascinating. So just tell us a little bit about your background and then how you came to write this book and, and what the book is all about. Absolutely, sure, thank you. Yeah, so I have been a journalist since um, 18 at school, you know, at University of Georgia working for the newspaper and the BBC and interning and working full-time for a newspaper while in school. Um, and I think it was just my way of really researching because I was so shy, I wanted to interview um, I was in charge of legal and, and interviewing all the sort of judges that came in. Um, and I really wanted to investigate some things that had happened uh, in high school, um, including some, you know, some murders and some shootings and some other things that had happened um, that I really didn't have the, the tools to sort of deal with. So I was interviewing experts on these topics. Um, and that got me a job right away, even before I graduated. I never even walked. I was in Maine working and I'd been in London working. So I was kind of a busy bee at a young age. Um, and that may look successful from the outside, but that's what ultimately led me uh, towards the path of, of yoga, <laughs> slowing down, if you know what I mean. Um, so all I can say is I worked at newspapers, um, magazines, um, you know, I wrote a book, went to grad school in New York, um, then got married and we moved to London and I was working for a magazine there. Um, and, uh, you know, pregnant with baby number two and I moved to uh, California for a specialist. I needed a specialist. Um, and then just, you know, life got really lifey. Um, and it was a hard journey. And now I can look back on it with gratitude because I had sort of stepped away from my fiction. Um, I had really stepped away from living a more centered, holistic kind of um, life grounded in gratitude. I wasn't there anymore. Um, but my, um, you know, my husband left, he went back to England. So I was, I was in California with two children, a seven-year-old and like an eight-month-old. Um, and I decided to stay and I went on this path and my mom, she uh, got early onset Alzheimer's and died sadly. And so um, these years were just so many things happened at once, um, like the rug being pulled out from under me. And I think sometimes these things can be blessings if we allow them, you know, and I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast before. Um, and so from there, I started going to yoga. And, you know, I had started a little bit of yoga when I was in London because my back kept going out, you know, wanting to, and it sort of got me in the back door, you know, in the South, like people will say, well, whatever gets them to church, you know, like, <laughs> and it was kind of, that was, that was the way it was for me, you know. Um, and so I went back to yoga and then I kept going through more and more trainings and ended up teaching. And what was interesting is that even though I was taking care of two kids solo, um, I mean, my ex is a good dad, but he's in Europe, so he would see them three weeks a year. So it was like full on. I still like had the time to dip into my fiction. Isn't that interesting? Like because I let go of fear and I think deep breathing, yoga, probably, you know, you can find your own outlet, whatever that is. Some people do it with running. That's fine. But for me, just opening up all the channels, you know, getting into the chakra alignment, breathing deeply, forgiving myself, forgiving others, all of this allowed me to get to that place where in my mind, I could go back to my fiction, right? And that I have something to say, it's not too late, not too old, you know, you, these things like our fear that, especially in America, we have, we have these goals we think we need to achieve at certain ages and outside 
voices get in our heads, right? And so I just kept writing on my own. So um, this novel, which is under my maiden name, Laura Cairo, um, Between Thoughts of You will be out in January. Um, and I'm very excited. It's actually my um, third novel. Um, the other two will probably get published after. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And three is my number, so, you know, and so I'm like, I'm okay with it. Um, and, uh, and it was really inspired by quite a lot of different things in my life, although uh, obviously it's so fictional. You know, I did spend two, um, you know, two summers, I spent a lot of time in Tuscany. Um, I've been to Italy many times, so there was that inspiration. Um, I've been to Hawaii many times, so there's that inspiration for my main character. Um, but I really wanted to get into when my mom was dying of Alzheimer's and she lost her memory. I really, I really wanted to get into that place of how, you know, we all sometimes die in many ways. We leave a part of ourselves behind, which I know I certainly had a rebirth after my divorce and everything. Like, and the parts of ourselves die as we embrace other things. And I think we have to get there with forgiveness. So this book is really a lot about what is love and what is forgiveness and how does that look? So that's a lot more information than you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though. I love that you, even though it's all fiction, you've taken aspects of your own life and built them into these characters and into the storyline and that you have written about something that affects every single person on the planet my belief is that we come here to experience different forms of love and that includes forgiveness. And I think there are so many people out there who have trouble forgiving people, but also more importantly, forgiving themselves for oh, yeah. their shortcomings or the mistakes they, they think that they've made, you know? So um, tell us a little bit more about how your book and the characters and how did you incorporate this idea of forgiveness? Well, I mean, Forgiveness is like a daily practice uh, on many levels, but really it comes to acceptance, right? Like, you know, and letting go of perfectionism. So in so many ways, I think all of us grapple with that. Like the perfectionists in my lives don't forgive themselves for making mistakes, even though they're the first to forgive others. You know, there's all these different, different personality types, you know? Um, and I can relate to all of them, but so I absolutely am madly in love with my main character, Lulu. Like, I wish I was her. And what's funny is a lot of my beta readers, because I sent it out to get, you know, just to get some feedback. And a lot of, it was so funny. The ones that were my friends were like, oh my gosh, you're so much like Lulu. And I'm nothing like her. Like, she is so, <laughs> like, I wish I was like her. She's so much stronger and she like, yeah, and super grounded. Like she knows who she is, you know? She's not trying to prove herself to anyone. She doesn't care what you think about her, you know? She, and she figures people out really quickly. Like there's just, she's just a fun character. So she is, um, how old is she? She is a 30 year old or 33 year old um, hospice nurse from Honolulu. She's Japanese Hawaiian with a little bit German. So she's got little tiny freckles and green apple eyes and long black hair that's like a curtain around her face. So she's the kind of person that she doesn't stand out, doesn't wear much makeup. She doesn't adorn herself or wear flashy clothes. She doesn't really stand out, but then the more you look at her, the more you wanna look at her. She kind of, she's the person that just draws people in just with her presence. Um, and after her daughter dies, uh, her daughter dies at three months of age um, and her husband three months later cheats on her with her best friend. It sounds appalling. And yet her husband is not a horrible person. And I will say that it's, you, you see that through the book, you know, but they're both dealing with this loss and they're both dealing with it in completely different ways. Lulu turns to ice and works all the time. Yeah. So anyway, so she, um, after this happens, she has nothing to live for. She's, she's, she's getting very depressed. Um, and, she decides that she's going to take a chance and someone at the hospital where she works has been talking to um, a gentleman, this Italian American New Yorker who's lives half the year in Honolulu and his wife keeps going in and out of the hospital for various issues. And he's looking for someone to finally take over care of his father 
and their Tuscan villa. And so his father keeps firing all these different nurses because one has man hands, one has nose hair. Like he's a really hilarious old man. He doesn't, he wants a pretty woman to take care of him. He doesn't like the fat women in Tuscany with their pantyhose rubbing against each other with their legs. Like he keeps firing these nurses and his four sons are just throwing their hands up. They don't know what to do and he refuses to die anywhere else. So he's got chronic pulmonary lung disease and he's determined to be in the villa, the first villa he bought when he first started making money from his olive oil business. So she decides, F it, I'm gonna move. Now you, you, the, you, the book starts though with her there, having a conversation with him, right? Cause where do you start a story? That's another topic I love to talk about, you know, because you can start it, story in so many different ways, but you, you see her there in Tuscany. Um, and so it goes between, just like this, the title, Between Thoughts of You, between her story and his story. And it's with conversations she's having with this very spunky Italian man who wakes up talking about the food he wants and wakes up talking about his dreams. And he is very triggered by Lulu because she looks a lot like the woman he has never forgotten. He fell madly in love with the daughter of a Japanese general when he, after the war, for one, like one to two years, he was in charge of an internment camp in Northern California where this family was sent and he had promised to marry her. Then he goes back to New York, bada bing, bada bang. He starts making a lot of money. He hooked up with some people that he had met in Sicily. He's making a lot of money. Um, and his um, mother wants him to marry a nice Italian girl from the neighborhood. No one's gonna marry a Japanese family, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and so he marries this other woman and starts his business and he never mentions Kiyomi's name again. He sees Lulu and he can't stop thinking about her. He starts dreaming about her. He starts telling her about stories from the war and from that time in the camp. And, and it's really interesting, you know, and then she, it triggers her to start thinking about Akani, her husband their life together like you know it's when you're really mad at someone especially if you've ever had a experience of betrayal it is so easy to make it black and white that's the bad guy i didn't do anything wrong and and you know at nine times out of ten like you, you know there's not it's not like a person does something wrong who gets betrayed let's put this let's get this straight you and i were talking about that before we started yeah. it's not that a woman or a man isn't attractive enough or you know, smart enough or fun enough, you know, when someone chooses to betray, they're stepping outside of their light, right? And they're hurting someone else instead of doing the honorable thing and either going to therapy or saying this isn't working. Like we all understand that. But I guess what I wanted to portray with this is that they're really, the, what is love? And love can exist separately outside of the way people behave. You know, the, the old man, Mr. Grasso, madly loved this woman. He loved her more than his wife, you know? And he never stopped forgetting about her. Now he still left her because he was into his greed. He was into his ego, wearing fancy suits, making money for the first time in his life, showing off, spending money, buying his parents a house. He was really into that. He was only 24 years old. It was like a big thing. Um, and, you know, Lulu remembers the good in her husband and it breaks her heart because she wants to hate him, right? Um, and then entering a side sort of, note of the book comes in Polly, the third son of the old man who uh, runs a restaurant called The French Whore in New York City. And he named it after his wife who cheated on him with her yoga teacher. So I had to throw that in there because I'm also a yoga teacher. And you know, you meet some phonies in every walk of life. Um, and Lulu helps Polly because he's never forgiven his ex-wife. Um, and he falls madly in love with her. And she sees him as the New York playboy that he is using women to get back at his ex-wife. And I won't give away the ending because the ending is not traditional. Um, and once the old man dies, he has this very spiritual moment where he actually sees Kiyomi, you know? And, um, and I just wanted to bring that in um, because I've had a near death experience and, and, and I just wanted to bring that in, you know, of like seeing loved ones. And then what's going to happen? Will Lulu go to New York with Polly? Will she go back to Honolulu? And then she also takes a trip to Tokyo and finds Kiyomi's daughter. She had been pregnant. So I'm not giving away the whole story, but it's just, there's all these different factors of love and what it means and how, and how you can survive it.
you know, when you love someone so deeply that you can't, you feel like you can't live without them, how do you move on, you know, so. I think that's really, um, it's so deep, first of all, all of those themes that you've woven into that story, but I think it's interesting, you and I were talking before, too, that you said that most people, when they are betrayed, they look to themselves, like, what did I do? Should I have lost 50 pounds? Should I have, you know, should I have been a prettier person, a better person? And you were talking about how in those situations, it's yeah. almost never about you. It's about the other person and how they don't love themselves enough or they let their ego get in the way. And just like in this story, how he let his ego get in the way and wanted to have the money and be the playboy around town and be the big shot and couldn't be seen with the person that he truly loved because yeah that would have been frowned upon yeah by his family and that really is ego that is like ego and fear getting in and I think that that plays a big part in a lot of people's relationships oh it's huge it is absolutely huge and um you know, and then also I sort of play, so Lulu's um, was raised by her great nan, Lulu, the main character in Hawaii. She was raised by her great nan. Um, her mother left and went back to Japan. Um, and, you know, her nan is a healer of sort of like the ancient traditions. So we bring that in about how, you know, um, so many, so many things are, are, um, affecting us every day our vibration so that gets twinkled in into sprinkled into this book and and one of them one of the things that nan says to her is something that i really believe at one point in the book where she's like you know don't go looking for trouble like you know lulu is convinced because her mother when lulu was a baby her mother did kill herself and her father was a pilot who was gone all the time um and so lulu's always had this fear that she's never been enough someone is going to leave her again um and that she's not as saucy or as fun her best friend it's like you know, i don't know if you, i'm a little like this like like i can be kind of yen and a lot of my friends are yang like you know what i mean like i'm not as big of an extrovert as some of my friends and it's just one of those things and so lulu's best friend from childhood is this very extroverted woman who's very sexy and saucy and drinks a lot and and in the back of her mind she's always thought oh my you know hot pro surfer husband is going to want her and, and our thinking and our fear has a lot to do with what ultimately manifests, right, in our lives. And so, you know, one could say, reading the book, well, did she manifest this with her thinking? Or, you know, was it Connie such an asshole? He could, I mean, he's a really hot guy with his own business. Like he has this a Connie stores all across the islands and like in two states. And, uh, you know, and like, he could have had anyone. Why did he decide to, you know, <clears throat> like have an affair with his wife's best friend? Like that was pretty, pretty, like, I don't know how anyone could forgive that, right? And so with all these flashbacks she has of memories, because they've known each other since they were three, you know, like her great nan and Connie's grandmother were best friends, you know, and like all these different memories and and I think that's what, at least for me, is the hardest part of getting over betrayal because you want to hate the other person. But when you do, it's a cancer, right? All that energy that we're bringing in of hating someone else. And then also that energy creates a vibration where you start attracting other people. See, all men are assholes. See, all men you can't trust, right? Like you have to, it's like you heal yourself by forgiving. It's not about, it's not, saying what they did is okay. It's saying, I love myself enough that I'm going to drop it. I'm not going to carry around all this hatred anymore. You're not having any more of that energy. I'm not running any more of my headspace to you. But it's not something we can do intellectually either. You can't just say that, snap your fingers and, oh, I'm, you know, I'm over it. And so the process for Lou is she had to keep busy taking care of, of this old man, Mr. Grasso, 24 seven was really a lot of work. She was very good at it, but she had to keep, keep, keep busy. And then when he would keep talking about how much he loved Kiyomi and yet he left her, of course it couldn't help but trigger her own stuff. And then Polly comes in and he's a playboy and he's really hurting a lot of women in New York because A, he doesn't trust women. 
he's got that mindset, like he still misses, you know, his, his wife who he was, he really, he really loved. And so um, how we deal with betrayal, I think can be as dangerous or more so than the act of betrayal. It has a ripple effect on everyone in our lives, right? Yeah. So I read a study once where uh, a physician equated unforgiveness with a, there was a correlation between that and cancer. Oh yeah. I believe that. And, and I've seen it myself in clients that I've worked with and done healing with a lot of the physical symptoms that they experience are directly related to energy blockages from things like not forgiving, not letting go, from emotions that they've held on to from childhood even, you know, oh, those yeah. fear of abandonment. That's a huge thing. Um, a lot of kids, even if their parents didn't physically leave them, if they had parents who were too busy and didn't oh, yeah. have time for them, then you see those adults with issues like abandonment issues because they think like they're, yeah. it ultimately, we, we put it on ourselves. Like it's not our parents' fault they were too busy. We weren't good enough for our parents to stop and pay attention to us. You know, and that's what we kind of take on, I've noticed. Oh, absolutely. And I, I teach um, um, kind of a restorative yoga classes and meditation. Um, and I work with cancer patients at a hospital here in, here in LA. Um, and I, I had a dear friend in college who died of a rare form of breast cancer. Um, and so when I say these things, it is in no way am I saying someone brought it on to themselves. That's the worst thing you can ever say to someone, you know, especially like a parent whose child died of cancer. It's like, come on, you know? And so I would never, ever say that. I do think there's an environmental collective that we are experiencing with how much mercury is in our fish. And, you know, there's a lot of things where we have a lot of pollutants, right? There's a lot of different issues and a genetic component. I'm a daughter of a geneticist. So I try to be very compassionate. And as a yoga teacher, I am surrounded by people who really believe that people's thoughts created their cancer. And, and maybe all of it is true, right? To a certain degree. But I do see among friends and family, those who are the most angry, who will never forgive, who aren't in the now, constantly are bringing up things from the past as justifications for what's happening. Well, of course, I knew he'd do that. Oh yeah, of course he would. Oh, he's never picked them up on time. Oh, you know, and all that stuff, you know, and, um, and it doesn't serve your kids and it doesn't serve their need to have a relationship with that spouse, you know, your, your ex-spouse, their parent. And, um, and it just hurts you. And then of course, like, so I, I just, it was a journey for me of learning that. And, um, and this book, I mean, Lulu is so strong. She's never gotten there. Do you know what I mean? She's never been that vitriolic and bitter. And that's why I wanted to create that, that person, that culture, you know, the, the Hawaiian who has, you know, some family that have been in Hawaii forever and you know and part Japanese and I wanted that culture and to have her man be a healer because even when you're surrounded by messages let's say you've read a new earth <laughs> you listen to um you, you know a lot of Wayne Dyer podcasts like what if you know you've got all of that under your you know Louise hey you've read heal your body you have all that but then your best friend betrays you and sleeps with your husband like what do you do? That's a double whammy. What do you do? And your child dies. You, you start to lose your, your faith in God too. Like what's going on? And, you know, and so I wanted to have all these components, not so it's depressing. It's really quite uplifting towards the, you know, but you, you get this, the journey to strength, like the, the strongest people I've ever met are not the ones that are the most physically strong, you know, they're the ones that can breathe and that can pause, you know, and I think that's, and just sort of surrender to the moment and like, what, what is, what is happening here instead of like pushing, fighting against it. Um, and so like the old man and Lulu and Akani to a certain degree, um, you know, and uh, his son, they all sort of really grow from this experience like really grow exponentially. And it just mirrors all the different ways we can grow, 
And that's why I wanted to write the book because I grapple a lot with what is love. I've done the Course in Miracles of Marianne Williamson and, you know, and, you know, if only love is real and everything else is an illusion. Well, like Mark Twain said, it's a pretty powerful illusion, you know, especially like we've got COVID, right? We, right now, right? You may have, you know, family members who are grappling with cancer. You may have a child who has a disorder, you know, these are real. Maybe you've, as a woman, you know, so many of us women, I think it's like one out of three will be attacked, you know, or, or attempted, you know, so we have these real issues that we're grappling with. And these are real and we have to deal with them. And yet when we try to, to come to some spiritual understanding that if only love is real and everything else is an illusion, what does that mean? And then if you're a yogi and you believe that everyone has a divine light linked to the divine, how, how do I think about that police officer that was on George Floyd's neck? How do I do that? How do I actually not think it's us versus them right? Democrats versus Republican, whatever. How do we not, how do we get back to that collective consciousness? And, and it, and it starts with your inner circle in my mind. It starts with your family. It starts with your friends. It starts with trying to understand that maybe they're not whole and they're outside of their intuition. They're behaving outside of their light. They've forgotten their connection. Maybe they're drinking a lot. Maybe they're hanging out with the wrong people. Maybe they're you know, it's like getting into their ego and their fear can can cause a whole ripple effect of behaviors. Now, those behaviors are real in the moment. If someone is threatening you, you need to get away, right? But when you can step back years later and think about it, that person was hurting. How do I forgive that person? Maybe they've gotten to AA. Maybe they've gotten sober. Maybe they're trying to make amends. And then can we be like you know, those Nelson Mandela's in the world that can say, okay, I forgive you. You had stepped away from who you really are. Who you really are is based in love, right? And um, it's, a, it's a hard concept to grasp for a lot of people. Because I think there's sometimes, there are certain people you will never get an apology from and who will never see the error of their actions. You know, right. um, my ex was that way and, you know, he passed away. And I never got the, I mean, he apologized once for things, but I never got the amends for all of the things that I had to put up with and go through with him. And I don't think that he actually, part of me feels like he didn't actually understand what he was doing. And then another, another part of me says, yes, he did. So it's that grappling with it. And it's a difficult thing, but I think that in holding on to those kinds of things, you're hurting yourself. And in not forgiving someone else, it's not hurting the other person. It's hurting you because you're the one carrying around that heavy emotional burden that comes with that situation. And when you can, and I read something else today that kind of jarred me a little bit. It said, when you hear spiritual people say, you shouldn't get mad, spiritual people don't get mad. It's like, that's ridiculous. Like everyone gets mad. That's an emotion that you feel. You have to feel your emotions. I think what we're trying to get to is a place where we feel it, acknowledge it, accept it, and are able to let it go. It's not staying in that place where we're holding on to that anger or that emotion and being able to move past that. But that's really, really hard when you're in the moment. Yeah. And I mean, and it's a messy process. People do chop. Absolutely. Every day, every day. And I mean, and honestly, if you think about it, like if you never get angry when someone mistreats you, it's almost like you're saying, oh, that's okay. You know, like that little girl or little boy who was mistreated by their parents. And so therefore, oh, everyone's supposed to mistreat me. That's okay. It's a very codependent, unloving way to be, to, to be like, okay, no worries. I, I, I'm putting your needs way above mine. I understand that maybe you were mentally unstable or maybe you came from a broken home and didn't know how to love me well. Oh, that's okay. No, it's okay to get angry because I think that's, in my opinion, I'm not an expert, but that's the first step to say, no, I deserve better. I deserve better, right? And then you can get to the forgiveness later. And honestly, you know, there are a lot of people that will never apologize in this world in this lifetime. And, um, and I read somewhere and I can't remember who actually said it. And I don't know if it was an Abraham thing or not, but, but it was just, you know, behave as if they have, 
because the light in them, you know, their higher self, if you believe in that, um, knows. On some level, they know. When they cross over, they know. And everyone in my life is a teacher, you know? Like my ex leaving taught me how to stand up for myself, taught me how to say no, because I suddenly had two kids and I'm Southern and I'm really good at volunteering and getting asked to do tons of things at schools. And I had to be like, no, I, I'm doing this all, I need to, you know? And then how to just tr sort of juggle, and I'm not always graceful about it, but, and to prioritize my creative writing and my yoga. You know, the old me, when I was married, would have felt like I had to beg and plead to spend money for yoga training or to work on a project where money wouldn't be coming in right away. Do you see what I mean? And then it was like, no, this is what I was born to do. This is what I need to do. This is what feeds my soul. And I'm gonna try, I'm gonna find ways to do that. And, and so it sort of helped me step into my truth. I don't know if I would have written three novels, two novels since the divorce. I'm halfway through another one, so that's good. Um, but it, do you know what I'm saying? It's like, I can look back now, but I mean, it's been 11 years. <laughs> that's a long time. So for me to smugly say, I just got over it, that would be BS. Like <laughs> it didn't happen right away. No, yeah. and it's like layers of an onion where you feel like you peeled away a layer and you've forgiven one thing and then five others come back up again and you have to keep revisiting it. And yeah. that's okay. I mean, it's a process, but, and you know, one thing that I found that just recently works really well for me is to visualize the person in my head and connect, try to connect to their higher self and yeah. say everything that I need to say. And get I it. love that. I do that too. Isn't that funny? Um, I had a spiritual coach for two years and she taught me to do that to and it's similar to like marianne williamson's course of miracles where you envision them in a, a ball of light and you say i forgive you i send you the holy spirit even if you have to say it screaming like i'm sending you the effing holy spirit you know whatever you just keep saying it until you can drop it out of your head it's kind of like a dump you know like i do kundalini yoga sometimes it's like just get it out of my head but um <clears throat> that's a whole other topic but but i loved this like in the early days when i was really going through it um you know, because divorce can be nasty, especially when you're whatever, right? Um, so I would visualize my my ex, like when I first met him, you know, and I would visualize that person, and we would be in the mountains. That's where he loves, and I would just have a conversation with him, you know, about thank you for being good to your boys. They act in the progressive present tense, like he's already doing the right things. Thank you for spending time with your boys. Thank you for doing the right thing. Thank you for being kind to me in front of them and setting a good example. Thank you for, you know, not drinking too much around the world. Like I would do these things um, and I've shared it with a couple of my friends and, um, you know, and everyone's on their own journey. So that's another thing that I try to do is just never ever give flat out advice to anyone because their journey because then it can make people feel bad and honestly like I had my days where I was curled up at the bottom of the shower you know it's like it's not it's not a pretty journey but um but I wouldn't be where I am now without it isn't that a miracle you know it's interesting and it sounds like you are on that journey yourself so absolutely absolutely I had written a book called Beautifully Broken. And, and it, it is my journey of how I survived divorce and single motherhood. And mm. same thing, you know, I, I have a lot of humor in that book where I talk about don't curl up on the couch with your carton of ice cream and, you know, that kind of thing. But we've all had days where we've had to do that, where we just have to get through. Um, and I think I agree with you in that I'm super glad that I went through it because it has taught me who I truly am. And I didn't know who I was before. So that's, that's amazing. Beautiful. I love the title of your book too. I was I'm thinking of the imagery it. of like the Japanese pottery that when mm -hmm. it breaks, they put it back together with that. the gold paint. Yes. I love that. And it becomes more valuable. More beautiful than ever. That's what I was uh, envisioning in that because I feel like that is what a lot of people have to go through and that is what our journey sometimes is about yeah. is that we have to be broken open 
in order to be filled with light, to be put back together again, to then go out and be our highest version of ourselves. And I think a lot of people think that going through a spiritual awakening or enlightenment is like, oh, well, you know, it's all sunshine and rainbows. And what they don't realize is it is like, they call it the dark night of the soul for a reason. It is a lot of pain. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, um, I, I can laugh now, but, and then it, it also, when you say go through a spiritual enlightenment, I sometimes feel like, I mean, there are no gurus, you know what I mean? Not on, not on planet earth. And I feel, and I feel like, you know, some days feel fabulous <laughs> and I'm in that zone and I'm in that vibration and my thoughts are great, you know, and then other days it's like, the house is a mess. Oh, I have a cereal. I, you know, my dish, I don't have a dishwasher still. I'm getting angry about the dishes piling up and I'm trying to be like this Zen mom and be in the moment, but I've got a magazine article due and something else going on and I'm supposed to do a science project. And I'm just like, I can even hear the sound in the back of my head, like, oh, what the fuck? You know, <laughs> just, you don't always have these. It's not like um, every day is, is on the spiritual high ground. <laughs> But I can have a sense of humor about it. And I know now, instead of to say, what the F and throw something, I go into my room and I meditate <laughs> until yeah. I feel better. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is a good time for me to step up, do something, clear my space. At, yeah, yeah, I had that moment the other day and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make some uh, smudge spray because my environment is, there's some kind of energy hanging around that's funky and I'm feeling it. So I have to do that too. I have to do that a lot. Um, I just, I've had, you know, the past week has been really busy. And so everyone thinks like, oh, you know, because you have a podcast and you're doing all these things, like everything's always going really well for you. And it's like, no, <laughs> that's not how it works. <laughs> no, I go through it too. And I have to stop and, and regather myself too and do meditation and things like that. And it's, yeah, it's a, an, an every day, it's a process. Just like, so I love that you talk about that in your book too, that just because you're surrounded by healers doesn't mean that your life's going to be, you're not, you're not always going to have all the answers, you know? And, and also what's interesting is that her nan is kind of tough love, you know, because she really, and, and I've experienced this with some of um, my friends in the yoga community, where um, if you really believe that we are, you know, eternal beings having a physical experience then when someone dies I remember when when my mom died someone said chin up you know she's not gone quote unquote chin up you know she's not gone and it was just kind of like you know but I'm grieving leave me alone you know like <laughs> because I you know but I mean yes she had Alzheimer's and for you know years and years before she passed I still couldn't pick up the phone and have that conversation with her but you know you just we, ha we, we have a process and, um, and, and when someone, you know, Lulu's daughter dies and she's haunted, like, you know, if you, if you breastfed, you, you have these moments in like, if you breastfed in bed, especially you have these moments where you're breastfeeding in bed and, you, and she can even smell the top of her head and the satin skin and all that, you know, it's like her body starts having this, um, contraction in her belly because that's where her grief is and that's I've felt that kind of grief before in the belly like our sometimes our body will send us these sensations because we're internalizing and we just won't let ourselves because her grandmother or her nan rather sorry would never she 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 frowned upon her crying like it was like child you know she's not dead like it's you know move on and it's but we still miss that it's like when someone loses you know, a lover and it's like, well, they're not here anymore. And I miss that. And now, of course, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole of always thinking I miss them. Like, you know, I, I highly recommend listening to Esther Hicks, Abraham of trying to, to, to reprogram the brain of think about thoughts that make you happy. Right. And so that you're not going down that rabbit hole. Cause that gets momentum where you'll end up on the couch with a bottle of bourbon and ice cream. <laughs> you know, like, exactly. no, you don't exactly. want that. Um, you know, go exercise, pump yourself up, surround yourself with beauty, you know, and, uh, but, but there is a process to that. And, and some people in spiritual circles will, will, I, I don't want to say shame and blame, but, you know, and also there's this idea that everything in your physical world is a manifestation of your thoughts. And to this, I have to say, if you've ever had a tragedy happen in your family, 
you know, maybe a teenager who was killed by a drunk driver. And, you know, there, there's tragedies in this world. And I, I sort of believe that our thoughts control so much. And yet there is the chaos principle because I can't, I can control how I respond to you, Melissa, you're like, um, and whether I respond, whether I react, but I can't control what you're going to do. They're like, just like, I can't control you. And so, so, so trying to, I think it, that's why I say there's no gurus because there's only experiences and we can learn from them and we can, we can grow from them. Um, and, and we can also be destroyed by them. And then of course, the other aspect is PTSD, which I, I think we need to have a lot of compassion for because, um, you know, women, especially who've been attacked or, you know, there'll be triggers in certain environments. And so we have, so we have to learn how to deal with, with, with lessening our triggers, right? Honoring ourselves and even saying no to people if going to certain bars or doing certain things gives you triggers and you just don't do that anymore. You know, it's like finding ways to not, you know what I mean? Um, so if hanging out with that uncle Bob who always drinks a ton, ton of scotch and pinches your ass bothers you, you can say no and not hang out with them, you know, like that. Kind of, but I mean, that's kind of making it a little tongue in cheek, but you get the idea. I, I really believe that there are so many layers and that um, there's not one answer for everything that we're feeling and we're allowed to have our feelings and to not punish ourselves because we're not perfect. The feelings for me are an indicator of where I am. Oh, that's interesting. Why am I so blue today? Oh, I didn't exercise for two days in a row and I ate a lot of sugar. And maybe that's, you know what I mean? Or maybe, oh, this is interesting. Maybe I haven't been meditating. Like, I think that, I think that women especially have this perfectionist. Once we get on the spiritual path of, well, what happened when I, when I stumbled? And it's like, well, we're human, you know? okay to honor yourself and to honor yeah so this book sounds amazing where can people find it if they want to go out and purchase their own copy oh absolutely so it's it's um getting published next month i don't have the exact date because um simon and schuster ingram there's um just with covid there's been some slowing down on the print press a little bit, but it is next month. And you can go to my website, Laura K. Rowe, spelled like fish eggs, R-O-E. So Laura K. Rowe.com. Um, and you will, and you'll see that it, it's, it'll be at Barnes and Noble and Amazon. And you can also, you can also pre-order from my website. And um, I wanted to just say, I also do yoga for writers um, retreats because I found a lot of journalists, my journalist friends drink a lot of coffee and don't exercise and kind of get in their monkey mind. And, um, and, uh, you know, we all don't want to end up like Hemingway or, you know, some of the other writers that drink a ton and get really depressed, right? Or Hunter S. Thompson, right? <laughs> so, um, so I am having a Maui retreat in September 21 with someone I adore named Heather Archer, who um, is an LA yoga teacher who just moved to Maui. And, um, and I'm giving away a spot in the retreat. So it's six days in Maui. It's yoga, it's writing, um, and, uh, adventures like hiking to waterfalls and stuff like that. So if you pre-order a book, you can win a spot that's worth like $2,000. And after COVID, I mean, I'm just dreaming of getting back to Maui. Like I just, I love the energy there. So I wanted to throw that out. That's, you know, one way to sort of, uh, I don't know, even start dreaming about traveling again, right? Hopefully by next September. I'm okay. so hopeful. I'm ready to travel again. I have not been anywhere this year and it's time. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. So I will also have, of course, her website link in the show notes. So you guys can go there and just click on it and go directly to her website. I want to thank you so much for being here with us. This was such a fun conversation. If you had any parting words of wisdom to give our listeners out there, what would that be? That every time you get into fear and anxiety, um, to pause and take a deep breath. Um, and just to know that fear is the opposite of love. And you know, you hear people say, well, push through it, you know, like put on your big girl panties and push through that fear. And I, I sometimes think that's not true. If you go down a dark alley and your spidey sense turns on, 
maybe you should listen to that intuition and not go down that alley, right? Don't push through your fear, you know, but um, when we have fear, what I'm trying to do, and maybe this is my intention this week, when I get into fear, I want to pause and ask it what it's telling me. Is this old programming? Is this old stuff? And then do some deep breaths, like three to five really deep breaths to settle the energy and, um, and move from there towards love. That's my intention. Well, thank you so much for being here with me. I can't wait until your book comes out. Thank, thank you so you. much for talking about it. Thank I you hope for that it is having me. <laughs> yes. And I want to thank all of you for being here with us today as well. As always, if you like this podcast, please subscribe. Please leave a positive review from wherever you're listening. You can leave me some stars on iTunes. That was super helpful. And also share it with anyone you think might enjoy it. If you want to follow me on social media, I go live Mondays at 5 30, excuse me, 6 30 Central Time on Facebook, where I do a free card reading. If you show up for the live, I will pull a card especially for you. I also have free guided meditations on my YouTube channel. So check that out. You can also work with me if you go to my website, melissaoatman.com. You will see all of the services I offer, and you can purchase a session directly from my website. I hope that you guys have a beautiful day from wherever you're listening. As always, I am sending you so much love and light, and I will talk to you soon. Bye, guys.